What a tender moment it is when one proposes. And that's our title this morning. And I've been looking into some books that we don't ordinarily preach from. And it occurred to me that maybe I ought to look at the Song of Solomon. Four and eight. Come with me from Lebanon, my spouse. With me from Lebanon. Look from the top of Amman, from the top of Shinar and Hermon, from the lion's dens, from the mountains of the leopards. What is the idea? The text is orientally picturesque, but what is the spiritual notion of it? I sat again the other day and read the whole book through. Why is that in the Bible? The idea is that the native home of the Shulamite virgin, the subject of the Song of Songs, is situated in northern Palestine. And Lebanon represents the western range overlooking the Mediterranean, which at that time was wild country, where beasts roamed and lodged. This black girl whom Solomon loved and desired as a bride, lived in this high, craggy, dangerous, cavernous region amid inhospitable scenes and close to the mountain haunts of leopards and lions, animals ferocious and deadly, watched her day after day as she tended the flocks. She had seen the bloody maws of lions and the fuzzy muzzles of leopards and slithering snakes recalling. There is rock fastness, forest, and jungle. And in such a place, this beautiful, delicate, feminine Shulamite has her home. That's one side of the picture. On the other side is the king who lives in Jerusalem the royal city at its zenith of prosperity and progress at this time, considered the city of perfection, Jerusalem, the city of peace, far from the haunts of leopards and lions and snakes. And this mighty king invites this woman to be his bride, to leave the crag and the din and the forest and the danger, to leave the jungle, Come to me from Lebanon, my spouse. From Lebanon, come to me. And come to Jerusalem, the center of civilization. Come to Jerusalem, the home of beauty, the reservoir of culture. Come to the king's palace, to safety, to joy, to a splendid inviolable home. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast go up thereon. The palace lawns shall not feel the insult of a serpent's coils. Come, come, please. Come with me from Lebanon. That is the attitude of the figures in this oriental poem. And that is the action of Christ in relationship to the church, his bride. This is the center of the Song of Songs, otherwise it does not make sense. The Lord is calling us, as Solomon called the Shulamite. She was far away in a place of desert, crags, caverns, jungle, and the king was sighing for her, calling her, desperate for her attention, and for her company, and for her affection, calling her away from danger and inhospitableness to the holy city with all its abundance, with its peace, its joy. He was calling her to become a jewel of the court. It sounds incredible. And we can't understand why Christ is so anxious to have us. What is man? that thou art mindful of him. But he calls, 
And he not only calls, he proposes. Christ who has everything, we who have nothing. He calls and he proposes. And he calls us away from the nativities of the present scene. He calls us. And the response is up to us as the response of a Shulamite was a condition of prophet grace and greatness. He tells us to forget, if necessary, even our own people. Come away. But he makes one thing very clear. You cannot answer the call and stay in Lebanon at the same time. You can't have one foot in Jerusalem and the other in the jungle. There's got to be a breaking of the umbilical, a clean separation. I have visited Lebanon and Jerusalem, and there's a long distance between the two. It would be impossible to reside in both at the same time. Come away. Come with me. But we say, Lord, it's hard to give up attachments. Really, it, it, it's a tempting offer, and everything you seem to offer is what one should desire, but there are other things to which I am attached, and it's hard to give it up, so be it. What in life worth having comes easy? And where are the pampered men of all ages? And what are they of brain and muscle? Indeed, are they really men? The things worth having in life generally come hard. Hard. A young girl at an academy said to me one day, Pastor, you know, after listening to God's word, I would really like to be a Christian, but I have so many friends who are not, and it's so hard to give them up. What shall I do? My answer was, you don't have to worry about that. You just start doing right and they'll get rid of you. They don't want you around once you start representing Jesus. Hard? Many of these things will take care of themselves when we begin to respond to God's call, to his proposal. When we make up our minds to turn resolutely from the jungle towards Jerusalem, you'll discover it's not really so hard after all. Hard to leave that which is native. Hard to give up some little things. I want to tell you something. Someday, somewhere, sometime. This church with its young people is going to rise up and fulfill the high destiny of her calling. Someday, somewhere, sometime, and I believe quite soon, this church is going to hit society with such impact as to tilt the balance sufficiently and cause heaven to split wide open. This church, soon, under the power of the latter rain, is going to have such an effect upon this world that it's going to bring God down. But that church that does that is going to be extraordinarily holy and pure. There's no need kidding ourselves. Ordinary folks are not going to heaven. You're going to have to be extraordinary. And the only way we can receive that preparation is through receiving the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. In order to do that, we've got to be willing to give up everything that displeases God, to walk out of the jungle altogether. Christ is calling us away from our animalism, you know, we start low down on the scale, all of us do, so that none of us has a right to talk about the rest of us. There is none righteous, no, not one. But he calls us, and the very fact of our being in existence and endowed with a moral nature is a call for us. 
to throw off all that is low and sensual and mean and wicked and hard and inferior and unworthy and to ascend to Jerusalem. So he calls. And he calls us with the voice of love. He calls us from the stony places, from low associations, from catty language and gutty music and sexy fashions, from the flesh and its lusts, from worldly delights. And he calls us to the upper spaces where one resides with God in joy, where the sky is blue and where the infinite liberty of God never degenerates into license. He is calling us to this. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. New, though yet a creature. Brand new. His tastes become new. His desires become new. And many of the things we thought we could never separate from we automatically lose our desire for when we answer God's call. But we must be new. Frankly, I am amazed sometimes as I consider the attitudes of some to whom the call has come. They hold on to nothing as though it were precious. Some seem amazed that they must change in order to be a Christian. And that amazes me. Some act as though the call is not to peace and joy and eternal life, but to a chain gang somewhere. As though God's going to throw them in prison at hard labor for the rest of their lives. He calls us to be his altogether. I almost despair of words and songs. David said, sing psalms with understanding. When you open your hymnal and begin to sing, you ought to first glance through the words of the song. And if these words express sentiments that are not yours, you ought to stand with your mouth shut and not sing a lie in church. Don't sing anywhere with Jesus, I will safely go, when you're unwilling to do it. Don't sing, wash me now, without within, or purge with fire, if that must be, unless you mean it. Someone has said, we have become great poets, but we live in prose. Sentimentalism has 10,000 words, images, symbols, an infinite jewelry of expression, and we know how to say things beautifully, and we say things that we don't mean. Even today, rock artists and perverts are singing our songs. Amazing Grace was number one on the hit parade in my town just a few weeks ago. They have jazzed up our spirituals and made them obnoxious to my ears. Words and songs which they do not mean. Pretty words will not advance us towards Gethsemane or to Calvary where self must be crucified before we can be resurrected to walk with him in newness of life. And we can actually deceive ourselves with words and miss the great utilities of our being. Let us see how great the danger of fancy power, sentimentalism. We can get into the high ecstasies of poetry and forget simply to be courteous to one another and kind and loving. And folk out there are looking for a church today where people are not just spouting doctrine, but where people just simply love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, said the Lord, if ye have love one toward another. But too many of us are like the young man who wrote a letter to his girlfriend and said, I'd climb the highest mountain, swim the deepest ocean, just to be with you. P.S. I'll drop by tonight if it doesn't rain. Just words. 
Words. Mother's Day is coming up soon. And we go down and buy a card and never read the message. Never read the Just a card that says, Happy Mother's Day. Don't mean what it says inside, and those messages are so pretty. A buddy of mine used to write them for a big company. Paid well. Think them up. Mother gets the card, and her heart skips a beat, and then as soon as she asks us to do something, we climb up the wall and scream our crazy heads off. Just words. Words. It is possible to sing hymns and live blasphemous. It's possible to wear a crucifix around the neck and never have a cross on the back. Just words. We are by nature the children of wrath. And our natures have to be changed. The black cloud of judgment rests over us. And our problem is one of nature. And the only solution is the new birth. And to answer the Lord's proposal is to yield to this operation of grace, one which he performs. Folks say to me, you know, Pastor, my problem is I live in a wicked city. If I lived in a small town instead of in Chicago or New York, I could live right. I don't buy that. The problem is not location. Nor was perfect in a generation so willfully impenitent that they were hopelessly lost. And yet he was perfect. And you can take a pig and put him in your living room and feed him what you eat. He's still a pig. The problem is nature, not location. And the new birth can take care of our perverted natures. The black cloud of judgment, I say, rests over every one of us, and Christ is calling us before it is too late, before his voice is heard no more. And he says, if it need be, cut off your right hand if it offends you. It's better to go to heaven with one hand than having two to be cast into hell. If your right eye offends you, Jesus says in Mark 9, pluck it out. It's better to go to heaven with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell. Let me carry it a little further. If the gang you run around with is standing between you and salvation, cut it off. Better to go into heaven lonely than to go to hell with a crowd. If the clothes you wear are going to keep you out of heaven, burn them up. Better to go to heaven with one long dress than go to hell in style. Whatever it takes, be sensible. Preachers have to preach, and folk act like they're doing us a favor just to listen. Me a favor? I'll be gone Saturday. And won't see some of you ever again. Then why do I come around and talk like this, or any other preacher for that matter? Why does God send us? You ought to see my wife. Why would I leave her to do this? Because of the sense of urgency because of the divine commission and because by the grace of God he has placed a love in the heart of the preacher for people and God calls come with me from Lebanon hard so it is it is therefore worth doing come with me from Lebanon but we always want to modify their terms and come on our own terms. We want to soften the tone so imperative in the king's summons. But my friends, the crucifixion must precede the resurrection. What does he call us from? Precisely what the Shulamite was called from. From stony places. From the desert. From desolation. From snakes from lions. When did Christ ever call anybody from knowledge to ignorance? When did he ever say, come from abundance to leanness? Or when did he ever say, come from riches to poverty? The terms of the gospel are couched in terms such as these, eat and drink abundantly. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come, come to the fountain. Come and buy without money. Did Christ ever say to anybody, Come unto me, all ye that are well rested, and I will give you labor and cause you to be heavily laden. Never in your life the gospel is generous and lavish 
It offers help and healing. It's the best life to live. Even if there were no heaven to go to, it would still be better to live the way the Lord says. You would make the best of this sorry mess down here, even if there were no heaven to go to. We're called from danger and damnation. This Shulamite woman, as you read about it and think about it, must have been something to look at. A woman of extraordinary beauty. And she was beautiful without the goop and the goo and all the jewelry and all of the regal garments of the court. She was a shepherdess. And in her plain garments, with her face clean, she did something to the heart of Solomon that nearly drove him wild. And when you think of someone like that living in a place like that, something inside of you says she has no business in a dangerous area like that. Somebody save her. There is something incongruous about a woman like that living in a place like that. I've listened to high quality music here. And I know that if someone got up here to sing with all the musical talent in this auditorium, if that person hit a sour note, the musicians in here would reel with insult. Not only that, but an artist can look at someone else's work and if one color has a fault, he is offended as though it were intended to insult his delicate sensibilities. An actor becomes angered when somebody blows a line. And I ask, is there no law of incongruity in morals? Oh, child of the king, you were meant for a palace. What are you doing in a theater? I should be insulted to hear you say that you've done that when the Lord has called you and claimed you. You, young man, made in the image of God, bursting with the vitality of youth, what are you doing with a joint of grass in your fingers? Aping the world, blowing your mind. Incongruous. You beautiful, soft, feminine, delicate girl, made to be admired, admired, and to evoke a response in the hearts of the gentlemen on campus, made to walk with angels in robes of white, what are you doing in a Babylonish garment? Trying to appear sexy. Why? Hit a sour chord and your music teacher will wince. Split a verb and the English teacher will faint. Use the wrong fork and your hostess will be horrified. So we preachers deal with the things of God and for God. And we support every appeal we make to men on the grounds of moral incongruity. Split a verb and you're only going to be embarrassed. Hit a sour note and you'll blush. But you blow eternal life and you're going to hell. It's a lot more serious than just being embarrassed. God, therefore, is calling us to high and holy living. And even when I look around and see God's young people to whom such privilege has been granted in the wrong places, I, like the artist, am offended is he doing there? A young man who attends this school goes into town, gets into trouble with the wrong crowd, and is locked up, and you say, I'm shot. What was he doing with them? You know that's the way we think. And if we think that way, I tell you, that's the way Jesus feels when he sees his young people 
at his school, wandering ar around, doing what others do, following old worldly trends. Christ is horrified. He looks down in shock, and he says, Is that soul for whom I've done so much dead? Dead within the tenement of that flesh? Is that person dead? Christ is shocked. Men of refinement, culture, pedantry, do not suppose that you can be shocked by the incongruities and lapses and false relations, and yet Jesus can look at his people doing wrong and simply overlook it. Christ is offended that this leprous earth is whirling around the sun in company with unfallen worlds. It bothers him, and he's going to do something about it. But before he does, he's pleading, come, please, come. I'm proposing to you. Don't turn me down. Don't jilt me. Come with me from Lebanon. I'm calling you home to security, to heaven. And herein he is like the man who sought the Shulamite. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may, but ye may be also. And if you make a decision to go from the jungle to Jerusalem, there's a cross along the way. For the cross is the linchpin of moral society, and every soul has got to pass by it. Jesus said, if any man would be my disciple, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. The cross, I say, is the linchpin of moral society. This is God's existential arrangement for the salvation of men. Like it or not, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to do some things you don't want to do. And you've got to stop doing some things you love to do. You've got to change. You've got to be willing. And the Lord will change us. But the fearful and unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Christ is proposing to us. We have nothing to offer him except impurity, which he must in turn cast away. And yet he calls us as though he's madly in love with us. And he is. He's calling us as though he needs us instead of the other way around. And he does. He is victimized by his own unspeakable love. He cannot do without us. And if in the last audit it were all for nothing, then so be it, nothing has been lost. We will have lived the best life down here. But that's not the way it's going to end. It's going to end in indescribable glory, relief, freedom, salvation. No more poverty. No more problems. No more sickness. No more cancer. No more hardness. No more broken hearts. No more tears. It's going to end like that. Who wouldn't want to go? And the call is to whoever will respond. There was a worker in a conference where I was, a very handsome man. And one of the top literature evangelists in that conference. At camp meeting time, he and I were walking across the campgrounds. It was very hot. We had our coats on and swung over our shoulders. And as we were about to pass the refreshment stand, he said, Pastor, let me buy you a cold drink. And we went aside for a moment, and he purchased two, and we went under a shade tree nearby and were slaking our thirst, and he turned his up and just let it go down. It was refreshing. And then he said to me, Pastor, you know, I used to drink liquor like this. And I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I said, not you. Oh, yes, he said, I was an alcoholic, full-fledged. I said, but man, you don't even have the marks on your face. You look like you've lived a clean life all your days. He said, that's grace. 
And then he told me a little bit about himself because he trusted me. He told me of the wretchedness of the alcoholic and how he considered everything up to suicide. Life was not worth living. He was a slave, and the devil is a terrible slave master. And he said finally he decided to seek God. And he went from place to place. And it was though the heavens were brass and the men who talked to him only further confused him. And finally one day he met an Adventist preacher. And he began to hear the gospel. It's going to take more than just saying Jesus loves you. All the other preachers told him that. You New Testament witnesses, that's great, but it's going to take a little more than just making friends. And he said he started studies in the minister's home. And sometimes if the minister studied too long, he got fidgety and, and the minister recognized the symptoms and let him go. And he said he literally ran to his car and under the seat his bottle. The more he studied and the more he believed, the farther away from it all he seemed to be. One day he got up and he said, I'm going to live right one day. I'm going to stay away from people. I'm going down by the river and I'm going to sit there all day long. I'm going to spend one day without drinking. And he said he walked down and sat on the bank of the James River. And after an hour or so, he saw an old man coming with a fishing rod and a creel. And the old man came near him and baited his hook and threw it out in the river. Sat down and opened his creel and pulled out a bottle. And he said, Pastor, I got drunk again. He said, I was so hopeless. I considered blowing my brains out. But then I kept remembering what the Adventist minister was telling me. So I got up one Saturday morning and I said, I'm going to join the church today. I thought I could overcome and then join. And that's the mistake a lot of people make. They figure they got to get straight to come to the Lord. If you could get straight, you wouldn't need to come to the Lord. You don't get straight to come to the Lord. You come to the Lord to get straight. So he said, I'm going to go today and join the church. Whether the habit is with me or not, I'm going to do it. And he did it. And he said when he walked down the aisle, it was like walking on a cloud. And he said the people were so nice. They took him home to dinner. Liquor never entered his mind. He stayed all day. He stayed for MV meeting. Heaven came down and glory filled his soul. And then he said... He said goodbye to his new brothers and sisters and started home to a rooming house where he lived. And when he got there, he heard a noise. And when he opened the door, there was his old gang in the parlor of that rooming house having a party. The music, the drinks, the smoke. And he said when he opened the door, his girlfriend was there and she flew in his face. Where have you been? I've been looking for you all day. And her glass was near his nose. And when he smelled it, every fiber of his being cried out for a drink. And he said, he said to her, excuse me a minute. And he went upstairs to his room and he closed the door. And he said he fell face down on the bed and said, Lord, after what's happened today, I come back here and I'm just as bad as ever. But please hold on to me. Don't let me go. And then he got to thinking, I'd better go back down lest they think something's wrong. So he went back down. And another friend came over and said, hey, man, have a drink. And right back it came, the devil on his shoulder, his mouth watering. He said, excuse me a minute. And he turned around and he went back upstairs and he fell across that bed again. He said, Lord, hear me. I don't want to get back into that. I feel that if I do, I can never be retrieved. Please. Hold on to me. And after a moment, he went back downstairs, and his girlfriend came over, and this time she was upset. And she said, listen, you don't seem to be enjoying yourself. What's wrong with you? Why don't you have a drink and, 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 and have some fun? What's wrong with you? He said, excuse me a minute. And he turned and he ran back upstairs and repeated that same prayer. And when he came down this time, she was waiting. And she said, listen, I want to know what's going on. Why is it every time I come to you, you take off upstairs? What's going on? And he had to face the music. He said, Pastor, you know, I thought if anybody would understand, she would. She said she loved me. So he took her aside and he said, listen, I joined the Seventh-day Adventist church today. And I promised God I wouldn't drink anymore. 
and I wouldn't do these things anymore. He said, Pastor, if ever I heard the laughter of a demon coming from a human throat, it came from hers. And instead of her keeping my little secret, you know, God didn't want it kept. Instead of her keeping my little secret, you mean God's going to make a witness out of a drunk? Instead of her keeping my little secret, she laughed out loud and attracted everybody's attention. And then she said, hey, folks, guess what? He, and then she had to laugh. He! And she couldn't say anything else. She just laughed again. He! Of all people, he! John the Adventist Church. And he said, he's not going to drink anymore. And they all began to laugh. And he stood there embarrassed. Why are we embarrassed when we're doing right? I made up my mind a long time ago, if people aren't ashamed and embarrassed to look like fools and dress like fools and talk like fools and act like fools, I'm not going to be embarrassed about the things God has told me to do. He said he stood there embarrassed, and the man who owned the place said, wait a minute, wait a minute, be quiet. And he turned and said to him, young man, is this true? Did you join the Adventist church today? Yes, sir. Did you promise God you were through with all this? Yes, sir. And then the owner of the home said to the rest of them, This party is over. I want you to leave. And when they left, the proprietor put his hand on the shoulder of Brother Toombs, and he said, Young man, I watched you running up and down those stairs, and I wondered what was wrong with you. But when you came down the last time, there was a strange light in your face. Come with me from the jungle. But Lord, I'm not drunk. Come with me. I'll put a light in your face. Let us stand for prayer. Lord, the devil's been worrying some of these young people something awful this week. They come in to see me and they tell me over and over and over how he has tried to discourage them, make them think they're too bad, that they're hopeless, they've gone too far. Now, Lord, you know the devil's a liar, and I know it. Let these young people hear thee calling. What could they possibly have done in so short a time that could cause them to feel hopeless before thy overwhelming love. Speak to them and let them hear thee calling. Let them hear thy proposal. Like a young swain on bent knee, you are begging them to marry you, to become a part of your bride. Give us the grace to say yes, no matter how bad we think we are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.